Section One of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Justin Bread. The Hosting of the Seether. The host is riding from Knocknaray and over the grave of Clutnabare. Quelter tossing his burning hair, and Neve calling, Away, come away, empty your heart of its mortal dream. The winds awaken, the leaves whirl round, our cheeks are pale, our hair is unbound, our breasts are heaving, our eyes are agleam, our arms are waving, our lips are apart, and if any gaze on our rushing band, we come between him and the deed of his hand, we come between him and the hope of his heart. The host is rushing twixt night and day, and where is their hope or deed as fair? Quelter tossing his burning hair, and Neve calling, Away, come away. End of section one. This recording is in the public domain. Section two of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Savannah Alday. The Everlasting Voices O sweet everlasting voices, be still. Go to the guards of the heavenly fold, and bid them wander, obeying your will. Flame under flame, till time be no more. Have you not heard that our hearts are old, that you call in birds and wind on the hill, and shake in boughs and tide on the shore? O oh, sweet everlasting voices, be still. End of section two. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Savannah Alday. Section three of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Savannah Alday. The Moods. Time drops in decay, like a candle burnt out, and the mountains and woods have their day, have their day. What one in the rout of the fire born moods has fallen away? End of section three. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Savannah Alday. Section 4 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson. A tells of the rose in his heart. All things uncomely and broken, all things worn out and old. The cry of a child by the roadway, the creak of a lumbering cart, the heavy steps of the ploughman splashing the wintry mould, are wronging your image that blossoms a rose in the deeps of my heart the wrong of unshapely things is a wrong too great to be told i hunger to build them anew and sit on a green knoll apart with the earth and the sky and the water remade like a casket of gold for my dreams of your image that blossoms a rose in the deep of my heart end of section 4 this recording is in the public domain section 5 of the wind among the reeds by william butler yeats read for librivox.org by simon smoke the host of the air o driscoll drove with a song the wild duck and the drake from the tall and the tufted reeds of the drear 
heart lake. And he saw how the reeds grew dark at the coming of night tide, and dreamed of the long dim hair of Bridget, his bride. He heard while he sang and dreamed a piper piping away, and never was piping so sad, and never was piping so gay. And he saw young men and young girls who danced on a level place, and Bridget his bride among them, with a sad and a gay face. The dancers crowded about him, and many a sweet thing said, and a young man brought him red wine, and a young girl white bread. But Bridget drew him by the sleeve away from the merry bands, two old men playing at cards with a twinkling of ancient hands. The bread and the wine had a doom, for these were the host of the air. He sat and played in a dream of her long, dim hair. He played with the merry old men and thought not of evil chance, until one bore Bridget, his bride, away from the merry dance. He bore her away in his arms, the handsomest young man there, and his neck and his breast and his arms were drowned in her long dim hair. O'Driscoll scattered the cards and out of his dream awoke. Old men and young men and young girls were gone like a drifting smoke. But he heard high up in the air, a piper piping away. And never was piping so sad, and never was piping so gay. End of section 5. This recording is in the public domain. Section 6 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly Brassal the Fisherman Although you hide in the ebb and flow Of the pale tide when the moon is set, The people of coming days will know About the casting out of my net, And how you have leapt times out of mind Over the little silver cords, And think that you were hard and unkind, And blame you, with many bitter words. End of section 6. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean Daly. Section 7 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Hermann Roskans. In France, December 2013. A Cradle Song The Danon children laugh In cradles of wrath gold And clap their hands together And half close their eyes For they will ride the north When the dear eagle flies With heavy whitening wings And a heart fallen cold I kiss my wailing child and press it to my breast and hear the narrow graves calling my child and me. Desolate winds that cry over the wandering sea. Desolate winds that hover in the flaming west. Desolate winds that beat the doors of heaven and beat the doors of hell and blow their many a whimpering ghost. O oh, heart, the winds have shaken, the unappeasable host 
is commonly than candles before Moria's sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 8 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Cusper Nyssen. Into the Twilight. Outworn heart in a time outworn, come clear of the nets of wrong and right. Laugh heart again in the grey twilight, sigh heart again in the dew of the morn. Your mother Airy is always young, dew ever shining and twilight grey. The hope fall from you and love decay, burning in fires of a slanderous tongue. Come heart, where hill is heaped upon hill, for there the mystical brotherhood of sun and moon and hollow and wood and river and stream work out their will. And God stands winding his lonely horn, and time and the world are ever in flight. And love is less kind than the grey twilight, and hope is less dear than the dew of the morn. End of section 8. This recording is in the public domain. Section 9 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Sung for LibriVox.org by Iswa The Song of Wandering Angus I went out to the hazel wood Because a fire was in my hand And cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing, and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream, and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire flame, but something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl, with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air though i am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon the golden apples of the sun end of section 9 this recording is in the public domain recording by Ezwa in belgium in august 2013 section 10 of the wind among the reeds by william butler yeats sung for librivox.org by Ezwa the Song of the Old Mother I rise in the dawn and I kneel and blow Till the seed of the fire flicker and glow And then I must scrub and bake and sweep Till stars are beginning 
to blink and peep and the young lie long and dream in the bed of the matching of ribbons for bosom and head and their day goes over in idleness and they sigh if the wind but lift a tress while i must work because i am old and the seed of the fire gets feeble and cold end of section 10 this recording is in the public domain Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in August 2013. Section 11 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Hallie Kill. The Fiddler of Dooney. When I play on my fiddle in Dooney, folk dance like a wave of the sea. My cousin is priest in Kilvarnet, my brother in Mohabari. I passed my brother and cousin, they read in their books of prayers. I read in my book of songs, I bought at the Sligo Fair. When we come at the end of time to Peter sitting in state, he will smile on the three old spirits, but call me first through the gate. For the good are always the merry, saved by an evil chance, and the merry love the fiddle, and the merry love to dance. And when the folk there spy me, they will all come up to me with here is the fiddler of Dooney and dance like a wave of the sea. End of section 11. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hallie Kill. Section 12 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Iswa. The Heart of the Woman. Oh, what to me the little room that was brimmed up with prayer and rest! He bade me out into the gloom, and my breast lies upon his breast. Oh, what to me my mother's care, the house where I was safe and warm! The shadowy blossom of my hair will hide us from the bitter storm. Oh, hiding hair and dewy eyes, I am no more with life and death. My heart upon his warm heart lies, my breath is mixed into his breath. End of section 12. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in August 2013. Section 13 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Giessen. A lament the loss of love. Pale brows, still hands, and dim hair. I had a beautiful friend, and dreamed that the old despair would end in love in the end. She looked in my heart one day, and saw your image was there she has gone weeping away end of section thirteen this recording is in the public domain section fourteen of the wind among the reeds by william butler yeats read for librivox dot org by eric domke mongan laments the change that has come upon him and his beloved do you not hear me calling, white deer with no horns? I have been changed to a hound with one red ear. I have been in the path of stones and the wood of thorns. For somebody hid hatred and hope and desire and fear under my feet that they follow you night and day. A man with a hazel wand came without sound. He changed me suddenly. I was looking another way. And now my calling is but the calling of a hound and time and birth and change are hurrying by. 
I would that the boar without bristles had come from the west, and had rooted the sun and moon and stars out of the sky, and lay in the darkness grunting and turning to his rest. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eric Domke. Section 15 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Simon Smoke. Michael Robartes bids his beloved be at peace. I hear the shadowy horses, their long manes shake, their hooves heavy with tumult, their eyes glimmering white. The north unfolds above them clinging, creeping night. The east, her hidden joy before the morning break. The west weeps in pale dew, and sighs passing away. The south is pouring down roses of crimson fire. O oh, vanity of sleep, hope, dream, endless desire! The horses of disaster plunge in the heavy clay. Beloved, let your eyes half close, and your heart beat over my heart, and your hair fall over my breast, drowning love's lonely hour in deep twilight of rest. And hiding their tossing manes, and their tumultuous feet. End of section 15 of The Wind Among the Reeds. This recording is in the public domain. Section 16 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Hanrahan Reproves the Curlew O oh, Curlew, cry no more in the air, or only to the waters in the west because your crying brings to my mind passion-dimmed eyes and long heavy hair that was shaken out over my breast there is enough evil in the crying of the wind end of section sixteen this recording is in the public domain Section 17 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Malone Michael Robarts remembers forgotten beauty. When my arms wrapped you round, I pressed my heart upon the loveliness that has long faded from the world, the jeweled crowns that kings have hurled in shadowy pools when armies fled, the love tales wove with silken thread by dreaming ladies upon cloth that has made fat the murderous moth, the roses that of old time were woven by ladies in their hair, the dew-cold lilies ladies bore through many a sacred corridor, where such gray clouds of incense rose that only the god's eyes did not close. For that pale breast and lingering hand come from a more dream-heavy land, a more dream-heavy hour than this. And when you sigh from kiss to kiss, I hear white beauty sighing too. For hours when all must fade like dew, Flame on flame, deep under deep, throne over throne, where in half sleep their swords upon their iron knees brood her high lonely mysteries. End of section 17. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Malone. Section 18 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Kasper Nijsen A Poet to His Beloved I bring you with reverent hands 
the books of my numberless dreams white woman that passion has worn as the tide wears the dove gray sands and with heart more old than the horn that is brimmed from the pale fire of time white woman with numberless dreams i bring you my passionate rhyme end of section eighteen this recording is in the public domain Section 19 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly. A gives his beloved certain rhymes. Fasten your hair with a golden pin, and bind up every wandering tress. I bade my heart build these poor rhymes. It worked at them day out, day in, building a sorrowful loveliness out of the battles of old times. You need but lift a pearl-pale hand and bind up your long hair and sigh. And all men's hearts must burn and beat, and candle-like foam on the dim sand, and stars climbing the dew-dropping sky, live but to light your passing feet. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean Daly. Section 20 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Iswa To my heart, bidding it have no fear Be you still, be you still, trembling heart Remember the wisdom out of the old days He who trembles before the flame and the flood And the winds that blow through the starry ways Let the starry winds and the flame and the flood Cover over and hide, for he has no part with the proud majestical multitude. End of section 20. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Iswa in Belgium in August 2013. Section 21 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Diana Meilinger. The Cap and Bells The jester walked in the garden. The garden had fallen still. He bade his soul rise upward and stand on her window sill. It rose in a straight blue garment when owls began to call. It had grown wise-tongued by thinking of a quiet and light footfall. But the young queen would not listen. She rose in her pale nightgown. She drew in the heavy casement and pushed the latches down. He bade his heart go to her when the owls called out no more. In a red and quivering garment it sank to her through the door. It had grown sweet-tongued by dreaming of a flutter of flower-like hair. But she took up her fan from the table and waved it off on the air. I have cap and bells, he pondered. I will send them to her and die. And when the morning whitened, he left them where she went by. She laid them upon her bosom under a cloud of her hair, and her red lips sang them a love song till stars grew out of the air. She opened her door and her window, and the heart and the soul came through. To her right hand came the red one, to her left hand came the blue. They set up a noise like crickets, a chattering wise and sweet, and her hair was a folded flower and the quiet of love in her feet. End of section 21. This recording is in the public domain. Section number 22 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Maureen Dempsey, September 2013. Maureen Dempsey dot me. The Valley of the Black Pig The dews drop slowly and dreams gather. Unknown spears suddenly hurtle before my dream-awakened eyes. And then the clash of fallen horsemen and the cries of unknown perishing armies beat about my ears. We who still labor by the cromlech on the shore, the gray cairn on the hill when the day sinks, drowned in dew. Being weary of the world's empires, bow down to you, 
master of the still stars and of the flaming door. End of section 22. This is a recording in the public domain. Section 23 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Jeremy Robertson. Michael Robarts asks forgiveness because of his many moods. If this importunate heart trouble your peace with words lighter than air, our hopes that in mere hoping flicker and cease, crumple the rose in your hair, and cover your lips with odorous twilight and say, O hearts of wind-blown flame, O winds elder than changing of night and day, that murmuring and longing came from marble cities loud with tabers of old in dove-gray fairy lands, from battle banners fold upon purple fold, queens wrought with glimmering hands, that saw young Neum hover with lovelorn face above the wandering tide, and lingered in the hidden desolate place where the last phoenix died, and wrapped the flames above his holy head, and still murmur and long, O piteous hearts, changing till change be dead, in a tumultuous song, and cover the pale blossoms of your breast with your dim, heavy hair, and trouble with a sigh for all things longing for rest, the odorous twilight there. End of section 23 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeremy Robertson Section 24 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Recorded for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly A Tells of a Valley Full of Lovers I dreamed that I stood in a valley, and amid sighs, for happy lovers passed two by two where I stood. And I dreamed my lost love came stealthily out of the wood, with her cloud-pale eyelids falling on dream-dimmed eyes. I cried in my dream, O oh, women bid the young men lay their heads on your knees, and drown their eyes with your hair, or remembering hers they will find no other face fair, till all the valleys of the world have been withered away. End of section 24. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean Daly. Section 25 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson. A tells of the perfect beauty. O oh, cloud pale eyelids, dream dimmed eyes, the poets labouring all their days to build a perfect beauty in rhyme are overthrown by a woman's gaze and by the unlabouring brood of the skies and therefore my heart will bow when dew is dropping sleep until god burn time before the unlabouring stars and you. End of section 25. This recording is in the public domain. Section 26 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly. Aid hears the cry of the sedge. I wander by the edge of this desolate lake, where wind cries in the sedge, until the axle break, that keeps the stars in their round, and hands hurl in the deep, the banners of east and west, and the girdle of light is unbound, your head will not lie on the breast of your beloved in sleep. End of section 26. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean Daly Section 27 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson A thinks of those who have spoken evil of his beloved. 
half close your eyelids loosen your hair and dream about the great and their pride they have spoken against you everywhere but weigh this song with the great and their pride i made it out of a mouthful of air their children's children shall say they have lied end of section 27 this recording is in the public domain section number 28 of the wind among the reeds by william butler yeats read for LibriVox.org by maureen dempsey september 2013 maureen dempsey dot me the blessed kumal called out bending his head till dothi came and stood with a blink in his eyes at the cave mouth between the wind and the wood and kumal said bending his knees i have come by the windy way to gather the half of your blessedness and to learn to pray when you pray i can bring you salmon out of the streams and heron out of the skies but dothi folded his hands and smiled with the secrets of god in his eyes and kumal saw like a drifting smoke all manner of blessed souls women and children young men with books and old men with croziers and stoles praise god and god's mother dothi said for god and god's mother have sent the blessedest souls that walk in the world to fill your heart with content and which is the blessedest kumal said where all are comely and good is it these that with the golden thurbos are singing about the wood my eyes are blinking dothi said with the secrets of god half blind but i can see where the wind goes and follow the way of the wind and the blessedness goes where the wind goes and when it is gone we are dead i see the blessedest soul in the world and he nods a drunken head. O oh, blessedness comes in the night and the day, and whither the wise heart knows, and one has seen the redness of wine, the incorruptible rose, that drowsily drops faint leaves on him, and the sweetness of desire, while time and the world are ebbing away in twilights of dew and of fire. End of section 28. This is a recording in the public domain. Section 29 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Hermann Hoskans In France, December 2013 The Secret Rose Far off, most secret and inviolate rose, Enfold me in my hour of hours, Where those who saw thee in the holy sepulchre, or in the wine vat, dwell beyond the stir and tumult of defeated dreams, and deep among pale eyelids, heavy with the sleep, men have named beauty. Thy great leaves enfold the ancient beards, the helms of ruby and gold of the crowned magi. And the king whose eye saw the pierced hands and rood of elder rise in druid vapour, and make the torches dim, till veiled frenzy awoke and he died, and him who met fun walking among flaming dew, and lost the world and him for a kiss, and him who drove the gods out of their lists, and till a hundred months had flowered red, feasted and wept the barrows of his dead. And the proud dreaming king, who flung the crown and sorrow away, and calling bard and clown, dwelt among wine-stained wanderers in deep woods, and him who sold tillage and house and goods and sought through lands and islands numberless years until he found with laughter and with tears 
a woman of so shining loveliness that men threshed corn at midnight by a tress, a little stolen tress. I, too, await the hour of thy great wind of love and hate. When shall the stars be blown about the sky like the sparks blown out of a smithy and die? Surely thine hour has come, thy great wind blows far off, most secret and inviolate troth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 30 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly. Hanrahan laments because of his wanderings. Oh, where is our mother of peace nodding her purple hood? For the winds that awaken the stars are blowing through my blood. I would that the death pale deer had come through the mountainside, and trampled the mountain away, and drunk up the murmuring tide. For the winds that awaken the stars are blowing through my blood, and our mother of peace has forgot me under her purple hood. End of section 30. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean Daly. Section 31 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read by Constantine, also known as the Mithril Weaver. The Travail of Passion When the flaming lute thronged angelic doors wide, When an immortal passion breathes in mortal clay, Our hearts endure the scourge, the plated thorns the way. Crowded with bitter faces, the wounds in palm and side. The hyssop heavy sponge, the flowers by Kidron stream. We will bend down and loosen our hair over you, that it may draw faint perfume and be heavy with dew. Lilies of death, pale hope, roses of passionate dream. End of section 31. This recording is in the public domain. Section 32 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Anastasia Saloha. The poet pleads with his friend for old friends. Though you're in your shining days, voices among the crowd, and new friends busy with your praise, be not unkind or proud, but think about old friends the most. Time's bitter flood will rise, your beauty perish and be lost for all eyes but these eyes. End of section 32 this recording is in the public domain. Section 33 from The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly. Hanrahan speaks to the lovers of his songs in coming days. O oh, Colleen's kneeling by your altar rails long hence. When songs I woe for my beloved hide the prayer, And smoke from this dead heart drifts through the violet air, And covers away the smoke of myrrh and frankincense. Bend down and pray for the great sin I wove in song, Till Moria of the wounded heart cry a sweet cry, And call to my beloved and me, No longer fly amid the hovering, piteous, penitential throng. End of section 33 this recording is in the public domain.
Recording by Sean Daly. Section 34 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly. A pleads with the elemental powers. The powers whose name and shape no living creature knows have pulled the immortal rose. And though the seven lights bowed in their dance and wept, the polar dragon slept. His heavy rings uncoiled from glimmering deep to deep. When will he wake from sleep? Great powers of falling wave and wind and windy fire, with your harmonious choir, encircle her I love and sing her into peace, that my old care may cease. Unfold your flaming wings and cover out of sight the nets of day and night. Dim powers of drowsy thought let her no longer be like the pale cup of the sea. When winds have gathered and sun and moon burn dim, above its cloudy rim. But let a gentle silence wrought with music flow, whither her footsteps go. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean Daly. Section 35 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Savannah Alday. Aed wishes his beloved were dead. Were you but lying, cold and dead, and lights were paling out of the west, you would come hither and bend your head, and I would lay my head on your breast, and you would murmur tender words, forgiving me because you were dead, nor would you rise and hasten away, they you have the will of the wild birds. But know your hair was bound and wound about the stars and moon and sun, a wood beloved that you lay under the dock leaves in the ground while lights were paling one by one. End of section 35. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Savannah Alday. Section 36 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Giessen. A wishes for the cloths of heaven. Had I the heaven's embroidered cloths, enwrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim, and the dark cloths of night, and light, and the half-light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Savannah Alday. Mongan thinks of his past greatness. I have drunk ale from the country of the young, and weep because I know all things now. I have been a hazel tree, and they hung, the pilot star, and the crooked plough. Among my leaves, and times out of mind, I became a rush that horses tread. I became a man, a hater of the wind, knowing one out of all things alone that his head would not lie on the breast or his lips on the hair of the woman that he loves until he dies. Although the rushes and the fowl of the air cry of his love with their pitiful cries. End of section 37. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Savannah Alday. Section 38 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly. Notes The Hosting of the She. The powerful and wealthy called the gods of ancient Ireland the Tuatha de Danann, or the tribes of the goddess Danu, but the poor called them, and still sometimes call them, the She. From A She or Slua She, the people of the fairy hills, as these words are usually explained. 
She is also Gaelic for wind, and certainly the she have much to do with the wind. They journey in whirling winds, the winds that were called the dance of the daughters of Herodias in the Middle Ages, Herodias doubtless taking the place of some old goddess. When the country people see the leaves whirling on the road, they bless themselves, because they believe the she to be passing by. They are almost always said to wear no covering upon their heads, and to let their hair stream out. And the great among them, for they have great and simple, go much upon horseback. If any one becomes too much interested in them, and sees them over much, he loses all interest in ordinary things. I shall write a great deal elsewhere about such enchanted persons, and can give but an example or two now. A woman near Gort, in Galway, says, there is a boy now, of the Clorans, but I wouldn't for the world let him think I spoke of him. It's two years since he came from America, and since that time he never went to Mass, or to church, or to fairs, or to market, or to stand on the crossroads, or to Hurlin, or to nothing. And if anyone comes into the house, it's into the room who'll slip, not to see them, and has to work. He has the garden dug to bits, and the whole place smeared with cow dung, and such a crop as was never seen and the elders all plated till they looked grand. One day he went as far as the chapel, but as soon as he got to the door he turned straight round again, as if he hadn't power to pass it. I wonder he wouldn't get the priest to read a mass for him or something. But the crop he has is grand, and you may know well he has some to help him. One hears many stories of the kind, and a man whose son is believed to go out riding among them at night tells me that he is careless about everything, and lies in bed until it is late in the day. A doctor believes this boy to be mad. Those that are at times away, as it is called, know all things, but are afraid to speak. A countryman at Kiltartan says, There is one of the Leidens, John, was away for seven years, lying in his bed, but brought away at nights, and he knew everything. And one Kearney up in the mountains, a cousin of his own, lost two hoggets, and came and told him, and he knew the very spot where they were, and told him, and he got them back again. But they were vexed at that and took away the power so that he never knew anything again, no more than another. This wisdom is the wisdom of the fools of the Celtic stories, that was above all the wisdom of the wise. Lamna, the fool of Finn, had so great wisdom that his head, cut from his body, was still able to sing and prophesy. And a writer in the Encyclopedia Britannica writes that Tristram, in the oldest form of the tale of Tristram and Isolt, drank wisdom and madness, the shadow of wisdom, and not love, out of the magic cup. The great of the old times are among the tribes of Danu, and are kings and queens among them. Quilter was a companion of Finn, and years after his death he appeared to a king in a forest, and was a flaming man, that he might lead him in the darkness. When the king asked him who he was, he said, I am your candlestick. I do not remember where I have read this story, and I have maybe half forgotten it. Neum was a beautiful woman of the tribes of Danu, that led Usheen to the country of the young, as their country is called. I have written about her in The Wandering of Usheen. And he came back, at last, to bitterness and weariness. Nocnore is in Sligo, and the country people say that Mev, still a great queen of the western Chi, is buried in the cairn of stones upon it. I have written of Clunabara in the Celtic twilight. She went all over the world, seeking a lake deep enough to drown her fairy life of which she had grown weary, leaping from hill to hill and setting up a cairn of stones wherever her feet lighted, until at last she found the deepest water in the world in Little Loch Ea, on the top of the Bird Mountain, in Sligo. I forget now where I heard this story, but it may have been from a priest at Caluni. Clunabada would mean the old woman of Bada, but is evidently a corruption of Kaliak Bada, the old woman Bada who under the names Bada and Bera and Beri and Vera and Dera and Dira appears in the legends of many places. Mr. O'Grady found her haunting Loch Lea high up on the top of a mountain of the Fuse, the Slee Fua, or Slee Cullen of old times, under the name of Kaliak Buria. He describes Loch Lea as a desolate moon-shaped lake, which made wells and sunken passages upon its borders, and beset by marsh and heather and grey boulders, and closes his flight of the eagle with a long rhapsody upon mountain and lake, because of the heroic tales and beautiful old myths that have hung about them always. He identifies the Kolyak Bulya with that Malakra who persuaded Finn to go to her amid the waters of Loch Lea, 
and so changed him with her enchantments, that though she had to free him because of the threats of the Fianna, his hair was ever afterwards as white as snow. To this day, the tribes of the goddess Danu that are in the waters beckon to men, and drown them in the waters. And Bare, or Dira, or Malakra, or whatever name one likes the best, is doubtless the name of a mistress among them. Malakra was daughter of Cullen, and Cullen, Mr. O'Grady calls, upon I know not what authority, a form of Lear, the master of waters. The people of the waters have been in all ages beautiful and changeable and lascivious, or beautiful and wise and lonely, for water is everywhere the signature of the fruitfulness of the body and of the fruitfulness of dreams. The white hair of Finn may be but another of the troubles of those that come to unearthly wisdom and earthly trouble, and the threats and violence of the Fianna against her, a different form of the threats and violence the country people use to make the tribes of Danu give up those that are away. Bada is now often called an ugly old woman, but Dr. Joyce says that one of her old names was Eben, which means beautiful. Eben was the goddess of the tribes of northern Leinster, and the lover she had made immortal, and who loved her perfectly, left her, and put on mortality to fight among them against the stranger, and died on the strand of Clontarf. End of section 38. This recording is in the public domain. Section 39 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Sean Daly. Notes A. Hanrahan and Michael Robarts in these poems. These are personages in The Secret Rose, but with the exception of some of Hanrahan's and one of A.'s poems, the poems are not out of that book. I have used them in this book more as principles of the mind than as actual personages. It is probable that only students of the magical tradition will understand me when I say that Michael Robarts is fire reflected in water, and that Hanrahan is fire blown by the wind, and that A, whose name is not merely the Irish form of Hugh, but the Irish for fire, is fire burning by itself. To put it in a different way, Hanrahan is the simplicity of an imagination too changeable to gather permanent possessions, or the adoration of the shepherds. And Michael Robarts is the pride of the imagination brooding upon the greatness of its possessions, or the adoration of the magi. While A is the myrrh and frankincense that the imagination offers continually before all that it loves. A pleads with the elemental powers. Mongan thinks of his past greatness. A hears the cry of the sedge. The rose has been for many centuries a symbol of spiritual love and supreme beauty. The Count Goblet da Viela thinks that it was once a symbol of the sun, itself a principal symbol of the divine nature and the symbolic heart of things. The lotus was in some eastern countries imagined blossoming upon the tree of life, as the flower of life, and is thus represented in Assyrian bas-reliefs. Because the rose, the flower sacred to the Virgin Mary, and the flower that Apuleius's adventurer ate, when he was changed out of the ass's shape and received in the fellowship of Isis, is the western flower of life, I have imagined it growing upon the tree of life. I once stood beside a man in Ireland when he saw it growing there in a vision that seemed to have wrapped him out of his body. He saw the Garden of Eden walled about, and on the top of a high mountain, as in certain medieval diagrams, and after passing the tree of knowledge, on which grew fruit full of troubled faces, and through whose branches flowed, he was told, sap that was human souls. He came to a tall, dark tree, with little bitter fruits, and was shown a kind of stair or ladder going up through the tree, and told to go up. And near the top of the tree, a beautiful woman, like the goddess of life associated with the tree in Assyria, gave him a rose that seemed to have been growing upon the tree. One finds the rose in the Irish poets, sometimes as a religious symbol, as in the phrase, the rose of Friday, meaning the rose of austerity, in a Gaelic poem in Dr. Hyde's Religious Songs of Connacht, and, I think, as a symbol of woman's beauty in the Gaelic song, Rosé and Dove, and a symbol of Ireland in Mangan's adaptation of Rosé and Dove, My Dark Rosaline, and in Mr. Aubrey de Vere's The Little Black Rose. 
I do not know any evidence to prove whether this symbol came to Ireland with medieval Christianity, or whether it has come down from Celtic times. I have read somewhere that a stone engraved with a Celtic god, who holds what looks like a rose in one hand, has been found somewhere in England, but I cannot find the reference, though I certainly made a note of it. If the rose was really a symbol of Ireland among the Gaelic poets, and if Rosean Dove is really a political poem, as some think, one may feel pretty certain that the ancient Celts associated the rose with Era, or Fotla, or Banba, goddesses who gave their names to Ireland, or with some principal god or goddess, for such symbols are not suddenly adopted or invented, but come out of mythology. I have made the seven lights, the constellation of the bear, lament for the theft of the rose, and I have made the dragon, the constellation Draco, the guardian of the rose, because these constellations move about the pole of the heavens, the ancient tree of life in many countries, and are often associated with the tree of life in mythology. It is this tree of life that I have put into the Song of Mungan, under its common Irish form of a hazel, and because it had sometimes the stars for fruit, I have hung upon it the crooked plough and the pilot star, as Gaelic-speaking Irishmen sometimes call the bear and the north star. I have made it an axle tree in A Hears the Cry of the Sedge, for this was another ancient way of representing it. End of section 39. This recording is in the public domain. Section 40 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by K. Hand. Notes The Host of the Air. Some writers distinguish between the Slua Gaweth, the host of the air, and the Slua She, the host of the She, and describe the host of the air as of a peculiar malignancy. Dr. Joyce says, of all the different kinds of goblins, air demons were most dreaded by the people. They lived among the clouds and mists and rocks and hated the human race with the utmost malignity. A very old Aaron charm, which contains the words, Send God by his strength between us and the host of the she, between us and the host of the air, seems also to distinguish among them. I am inclined, however, to think that the distinction came in with Christianity and its belief about the prince of the air, for the host of the she, as I have already explained, are closely associated with the wind. They are said to steal brides just after their marriage and sometimes in a blast of wind. A man in Galway says, at Oghanish, there were two couples came to the shore to be married, and one of the newly married women was in the boat with the priest, and they going back to the island. And a sudden blast of wind came, and the priest said some blessed words that were able to save himself, but the girl was swept. This woman was drowned, but more often the persons who are taken get the touch, as it is called, and fall into half a dream, and grow indifferent to all things, for their true life has gone out of the world, and is among the hills and the forts of the she. A fairy doctor has told me that his wife got the touch at her marriage, because there was one of them wanted her, and the way he knew for certain was, that when he took a pitchfork out of the rafters, and told her it was a broom, she said, it is a broom. She was, the truth is, in the magical sleep to which people have given a new name lately, that makes the imagination so passive that it can be molded by any voice in any world into any shape. A mere likeness of some old woman, or even old animal, someone or something that she have no longer a use for, is believed to be left instead of the person who is away. This someone or something can, it is thought, be driven away by threats or by violence, though I have heard country women say that violence is wrong, which perhaps awakes the soul out of the magical sleep. The story in the poem is founded on the old Gaelic ballad that was sung and translated for me by a woman at Ballisodare in County Sligo. But in the ballad, the husband found the keeners keening his wife when he got to his house. She was swept at once, but the she are said to value those the most whom they but cast into a half-dream, which may last for years, for they need the help of a living person in most of the things they do. 
there are many stories of people who seem to die and be buried though the country people will tell you it is but some one or something put in their place that dies and is buried and yet are brought back afterwards these tales are perhaps memories of true awakenings out of the magical sleep molded by the imagination under the influence of a mystical doctrine which it understands too literally into the shape of some well-known traditional tale one does not hear them as one hears the others from the persons who are away or from their wives or husbands and one old man who had often seen the she began one of them with maybe it is all vanity here is a tale that a friend of mine heard in the burren hills and it is a type of all there was a girl to be married and she didn't like the man and she cried when the day was coming and said she wouldn't go along with him and the mother said get into the bed then and i'll say that you're sick and so she did and when the man came the mother said to him you can't get her she's sick in the bed and he looked in and said that's not my wife that's in the bed it's some old hag and the mother began to cry and to roar and he went out and got two hampers of turf and made a fire that they thought he was going to burn the house down and when the fire was kindled come out now says he and we'll see who you are when i'll put you on the fire and when she heard that she gave one leap and was out of the house and they saw then it was an old hag she was well the man asked the advice of an old woman and she bid him go to a fairy bush that was near and he might get some word of her so he went there at night and saw all sorts of grand people and they in carriages or riding on horses and among them he could see the girl he came to look for so he went again to the old woman and she said if you can get the three bits of blackthorn out of her hair you'll get her again so that night he went again and that time he only got hold of a bit of her hair but the old woman told him that was no use and that he was put back now and it might be twelve nights before he'd get her but on the fourth night he got the third bit of blackthorn and he took her and she came away with him he never told the mother he had got her but one day she saw her at a fair and says she that's my daughter i know her by the smile and by the laugh of her and she with a shawl about her head so the husband said you're right there and hard i worked to get her she spoke often of the grand things she saw underground and how she used to have wine to drink and to drive out in a carriage with four horses every night and she used to be able to see her husband when he came to look for her and she was greatly afraid he'd get a drop of the wine for then he would have come underground and never left it again and she was glad herself to come to earth again and not to be left there the old gaelic literature is full of the appeals of the tribes of the goddess danu to mortals whom they would bring into their country but the song of midher to the beautiful etain the wife of the king who was called echade the ploughman is the type of all o beautiful woman come with me to the marvellous land where one listens to a sweet music where one has spring flowers in one's hair where the body is like snow from head to foot where no one is sad or silent where teeth are white and eyebrows are black cheeks red like foxglove in flower ireland is beautiful but not so beautiful as the great plain i call you to the beer of ireland is heady but the beer of the great plain is much more heady how marvellous is the country i am speaking of youth does not grow old there streams with warm flood flow there sometimes mead sometimes wine men are charming and without a blot there and love is not forbidden there o woman when you come into my powerful country you will wear a crown of gold upon your head i will give you the flesh of swine and you will have beer and milk to drink o beautiful woman o beautiful woman come with me end of section 40 this recording is in the public domain section 41 of the wind among the reeds by william butler yates Recorded for LibriVox.org by Kadir Carter. Notes A Cradle Song Mihal Rabartis asks forgiveness because of his many moods. I use the wind as a symbol of vague desires and hopes. Not merely because of she or in the wind, or because the wind bloweth as it listeth, 
but because wind and spirit and vague desire have been associated everywhere. A Highland scholar tells me that his country people use the wind in their talk and in their proverbs as I use it in my poem. The Song of Wandering Angus The tribes of the goddess Danu can take all shapes, and those that are in the waters take often the shape of fish. A woman of Boran in Galway says, There are more of them in the sea than on the land and they sometimes try to come over the side of the boat in the form of fishes, for they can take their choice shape. At other times they are beautiful women, and another Galway woman says, Surely those things are in the sea as well as on land. My father was out fishing one night off Tyrone, and something came beside the boat that had eyes shining like candles, and then a wave came in, and a storm rose all in a minute. And whatever was in the wave, the weight of it had like to sink the boat. And then they saw that it was a woman in the sea that had the shining eyes. So my father went to the priest, and he bid him always to take a drop of holy water and a pinch of salt out in the boat with him, and nothing could harm him. The poem was suggested to me by a Greek folk song, but the folk belief of Greece is very like that of Ireland and I certainly thought when I wrote it, of Ireland, and of the spirits that are in Ireland. An old man who was cutting a quick-set hedge near Gort in Galway said, only the other day, one time I was cutting timber over an inchy, and about eight o'clock one morning when I got there, I saw a girl picking nuts, with her hair hanging down over her shoulders, brown hair, and she had a good clean face, and she was tall, and nothing on her head, and addressed no way gaudy, but simple. And when she felt me coming, she gathered herself up, and was gone, as if the earth had swallowed her up. And I followed her, and looked for her, but I never could see her again from that day to this, never again. The County Galway people use the word clean in its old sense of fresh and comely. Michal Rabartis bids his beloved be at peace. November, the old beginning of winter, or of the victory of the Fomor, or powers of death and dismay and cold and darkness, is associated by the Irish people with the horse-shaped Pugas, who are now mischievous spirits, but were once Fomorian divinities. I think that they may have some connection with the horses of Mananan, who reigned over the country of the dead, where the Fomorian Tethra reigned also. And the horses of Mananan, though they could cross a land as easily as a sea, are constantly associated with the waves. Some Neoplatonists, I forget who, describe the sea as a symbol of the drifting and definite bitterness of life, and I believe there is like symbolism intended in the many Irish voyages to the islands of enchantment or that there was, at any rate, in the mythology out of which these stories have been shaped. I follow much Irish and other mythology, and the magical tradition, in associating the north with night and sleep, and the east, the place of sunrise, with hope, and the south, the place of the sun, when at its height, with passion and desire, and the west, the place of sunset, with fading, and dreaming things. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by K. Hand. Notes Mongan laments the change that has come upon him and his beloved. Hanrahan laments because of his wanderings. My deer and hound are properly related to the deer and hound that flicker in and out of the various tellings of the Arthurian legends, leading different knights upon adventures, and to the hounds and to the hornless deer at the beginning of, I think, all tellings of Oshin's journey to the country of the young. 
the hound is certainly related to the hounds of anuvin or of hades who are white and have red ears and were heard and are perhaps still heard by welsh peasants following some flying thing in the night winds and is probably related to the hounds that irish country people believe will awake and seize the souls of the dead if you lament them too loudly or too soon and to the hound the son of satanta killed on what was certainly in the first form of the tale a visit to the celtic hades an old woman told a friend and myself that she saw what she thought were white birds flying over an enchanted place but found when she got near that they had dogs heads and i do not doubt that my hound and these dog-headed birds are of the same family i got my hound and deer out of a last century gaelic proem about oshin's journey to the country of the young after the hunting of the hornless deer that leads him to the seashore and while he is riding over the sea with niam he sees amid the waters i have not the gaelic poem by me and describe it from memory a young man following a girl who has a golden apple and afterwards a hound with one red ear following a deer with no horns this hound and this deer seem plain images in the desire of man which is for the woman and the desire of the woman which is for the desire of the man and of all desires that are as these i have read them in this way in the wanderings of yushin or oshin and have made my lover sigh because he has seen in their faces the immortal desire of immortals a solar mythologist would perhaps say that the girl with the golden apple was once the winter or night carrying the sun away and the deer without horns like the bear without bristles darkness flying the night he would certainly i think say that when cuchulain whom professor rees calls a solar hero hunted the enchanted deer of sleeve fuad because the battle fury was still on him he was the sun pursuing clouds or cold or darkness i have understood them in this sense in hanrahan laments because of his wandering and made hanrahan long for the day when they fragments of ancestral darkness will overthrow the world the desire of the woman the flying darkness it is all one the image a cross a man preaching in the wilderness a dancing salome a lily in a girl's hand a flame leaping a globe with wings a pale sunset over still waters is an eternal act but our understandings are temporal and understand but a little at a time the man in my poem who has a hazel wand may have been angus master of love and i have made the boar without bristles come out of the west because the place of sunset was in ireland as in other countries a place of symbolic darkness and death the cap and bells i dreamed this story exactly as i have written it and dreamed another long dream after it trying to make out its meaning and whether i was to write it in prose or verse the first dream was more a vision than a dream for it was beautiful and coherent and gave me the sense of illumination and exaltation that one gets from visions while the second dream was confused and meaningless the poem has always meant a great deal to me though as is the way with symbolic poems it has not always meant quite the same thing blake would have said the authors are in eternity and i am quite sure they can only be questioned in dreams end of section 42 this recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Green Notes The Valley of the Black Pig All over Ireland there are prophecies of the coming rout of the enemies of Ireland in a certain Valley of the Black Pig and these prophecies are no doubt now as they were in the fenian days a political force i have heard of one man who would not give any money to the land league because the battle could not be until the close of the century but as a rule periods of trouble bring prophecies of its near coming a few years before my time an old man who lived at lissadol in sligo used to fall down in a fit and rave out descriptions of the battle. And a man in Sligo has told me that it will be so great a battle that the horses shall go up to their fetlocks in blood, and that their girths, when it's over, will rot from their bellies for lack of a hand to unbuckle them. The battle is a mythological battle, and the black pig is one with the bristleless boar that killed Dearmod in November upon the western end of Ben Bulban. 
Miss Royda, Macdatha's son, whose carving brought on so great a battle, the croppy black sow and the cutty black sow of Welsh November rhymes, Celtic heathendom, pages 509 to 516. The boar that killed Adonis, the boar that killed Attis, and the pig embodiment of Typhon, Golden Bough, 2, pages 26, 31. The pig seems to have been originally a genius of the corn, and seemingly because the too great power of their divinity makes divine things dangerous to mortals, its flesh was forbidden to many eastern nations. But, as the meaning of the prohibition was forgotten, abhorrence took the place of reverence. Pigs and boars grew into types of evil, and were described as the enemies of the very gods they once typified. Golden Bough, 2, 26-31, 56-57. The pig would therefore become the black pig, a type of cold and of winter that awake in November, the old beginning of winter, to do battle with the summer and with the fruit and the leaves, and finally, as I suggest, and as I believe for the purposes of poetry, of the darkness that will at last destroy the gods and the world. The country people say there is no shape for a spirit to take so dangerous as the shape of a pig, and a Galway blacksmith, and blacksmiths are thought to be especially protected, says he would be afraid to meet a pig on the road at night. And another Galway man tells this story. There was a man coming the road from Gort to Garyland one night, and he had a drop taken, and before him on the road he saw a pig walking, and having a drop in, he gave a shout, and made a kick at it, and bid it get out of that. And by the time he got home, his arm was swelled from the shoulder to be as big as a bag, and he couldn't use his hand with the pain of it. And his wife brought him after a few days to a woman that used to do cures at Russian, and on the road all she could do would hardly keep him from lying down to sleep on the grass. And when they got to the woman, she knew all that happened, and says she, It's well for you that your wife didn't let you fall asleep on the grass, for if you had done that but even for one instant, you'd be a lost man. It is possible that bristles were associated with fertility, as the tale certainly was, for a pig's tail is stuck into the ground in Courland, that the corn may grow abundantly and the tails of pigs and other animal embodiments of the corn genius are dragged over the ground to make it fertile in different countries. Professor Rees, who considers the bristleless boar a symbol of darkness and cold, rather than of winter and cold, thinks it was without bristles because the darkness is shorn away by the sun. It may have had different meanings, just as the scourging of the man-god has had different, though not contradictory, meanings, in different epochs of the world. The battle should, I believe, be compared with three other battles. A battle the she are said to fight when a person is being taken away by them. A battle they are said to fight in November for the harvest. The great battle the tribes of the goddess Danu fought, according to the Gaelic chroniclers, with the Fomor at Mautura, or the Towery Plain. I have heard of the battle over the dying both in County Galway and in the Isles of Arran, an old Arran fisherman having told me that it was fought over two of his children, and that he found blood in a box he had for keeping fish when it was over, and I have written about it and given examples elsewhere. A fairy doctor on the borders of Galway and Clare explained it as a battle between the friends and enemies of the dying the one party trying to take them, and the other trying to save them from being taken. It may once, when the land of the she was the only other world, and when every man who died was carried thither, have always accompanied death. I suggest that the battle between the tribes and the goddess Danu, the powers of light and warmth and fruitfulness and goodness, and the foam war, 
the powers of darkness and cold and barrenness and badness, upon the towery plain was the establishment of the habitable world, the rout of the ancestral darkness, that the battle among the she for the harvest is the annual battle of summer and winter, that the battle among the she at a man's death is the battle of life and death, and that the battle of the black pig is the battle between the manifest world and the ancestral darkness at the end of all things, and that all these battles are one, the battle of all things with shadowy decay. Once a symbolism has possessed the imagination of large numbers of men, it becomes, as I believe, an embodiment of disembodied powers, and repeats itself in dreams and visions, age after age. End of section 43 This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by K. Hand. Notes The Secret Rose. I find that I have unintentionally changed the old story of Conchobar's death. He did not see the crucifixion in a vision, but was told about it. He had been struck by a ball made of the dried brain of a dead enemy and hurled out of a sling and this ball had been left in his head, and his head had been mended, the book of Leinster says, with thread of gold because his hair was like gold. Keating, a writer at the time of Elizabeth, says, in that state did he remain seven years until the Friday on which Christ was crucified, according to some historians. And when he saw the unusual changes of the creation, and the eclipse of the sun and the moon at its full, he asked of Buckrock, a Leinster druid who was along with him, what was it that brought that unusual change upon the planets of heaven and earth? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said the druid, who is now being crucified by the Jews. That is a pity, said Conchobar. Were I in his presence, I would kill those who were putting him to death. And with that he brought out his sword and rushed at a woody grove which was convenient to him, and began to cut and fell it. And what he said was, that if he were among the Jews, that was the usage he would give them. And from the excessiveness of his fury which seized upon him, the ball started out of his head, and some of the brain came after it, and in that way he died. The wood of Lanchre in Ferro Royce is the name by which that shrubby wood is called. I have imagined Cuchelain meeting Fond walking among flaming dew. The story of their love is one of the most beautiful of our old tales. Two birds, bound one to another with a chain of gold, came to a lake side where Cuchillain and the host of Ulad was encamped, and sang so sweetly that all the host fell into a magic sleep. Presently they took the shape of two beautiful women and cast a magical weakness upon Cuchillain, in which he lay for a year. At the year's end, and Angus, who was probably Angus, the master of love, one of the greatest of the children of the goddess Danu, came and sat upon his bedside, and sang how Fond, the wife of Mananan, the master of the sea and of the islands of the dead, loved him, and that if he would come into the country of the gods where there was wine and gold and silver, Fond and Laban, her sister, would heal him of his magical weakness. Cuchillain went to the country of the gods, and after being for a month the lover of Fond, made her a promise to meet her at a place called the Yew at the Strand's End, and came back to the earth. Emer, his mortal wife, won his love again, and Manananan came to the Yew at the Strand's End and carried Fond away. When Cuchillain saw her going, his love for her fell upon him again, and he went mad, and wandered among the mountains without food or drink, until he was at last cured by a druid drink of forgetfulness. I have founded the man who drove the gods out of their lists, or fort, upon something I have read about Caelty, after the battle of Gabra, when almost all his companions were killed, driving the gods out of their lists, either at Osre, now Osri, or at Is-Ruad, now Asero, 
a waterfall at Ballyshannon, where Ilbrek, one of the children of the goddess Danu, had a lis. I am writing away from most of my books, and have not been able to find the passage, but I certainly read it somewhere. I have founded the proud dreaming king upon Fergus, the son of Roy, the legendary poet of the quest of the bull of Colge, as he is in the ancient story of Deirdre and in modern poems by Ferguson. He married Nessa, and Ferguson makes him tell how she took him captive in a single look. I am but an empty shade, far from life and passion laid, yet does sweet remembrance thrill all my shadowy being still. Presently, because of his great love, he gave up his throne to Conchabar, her son by another, and lived out his days feasting and fighting and hunting. His promise never to refuse a feast from a certain comrade, and the mischief that came by his promise, and the vengeance he took afterwards, are a principal theme of the poets. I have explained my imagination of him in Fergus and the Druid, and in a little song in the second act of the Countess Kathleen. I have founded him who sold tillage and house and goods upon something in the red pony, a folk tale in Mr. Lermanee's West Irish Folk Tales. A young man saw a light before him on the high road. When he came as far, there was an open box on the road and a light coming up out of it. He took up the box. There was a lock of hair in it. Presently he had to go to become the servant of a king for his living. There were eleven boys. When they were going out into the stable at ten o'clock, each of them took a light, but he. He took no candle at all with him. Each of them went into his own stable. When he went into his stable, he opened the box. He left it in a hole in the wall. The light was great. It was twice as much as in the other stables. The king hears of it and makes him show him the box. The king says, You must go and bring me the woman to whom the hair belongs. In the end, the young man, and not the king, marries the woman. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. End of The Wind Among the Reeds by William Butler Yeats.